On September the 1st, 1715, Louis XIV died, and France sighed with relief. He had been king for 72 years, longer than any other European monarch. He was succeeded by his grandson, who was just five years old, so his nephew, Philip, Duke of Orléans, was appointed regent. The period became known as La Régence. The court moved from Versailles back to Paris. Aristocrats celebrated elaborate festivities. The arts blossomed. Everything became more light-hearted. People enjoyed parties and the theatre. This was where the Rococo style emerged, and it was the world of Antoine Watteau. His paintings are graceful and often depict festivities or theatrical performances, like French or Italian comedies. Actors of Commedia dell'arte gather by moonlight. Pierrot holds a torch, and Mezzotin is playing the guitar, representing the two principles of theatre, light and sound, movement and dialogue, seeing and hearing, as a delight for the senses. The dance, painted around 1719, also exemplifies the grace, elegance and lightness of Watteau's world. Children are performing a bucolic piece about shepherds. The beautiful iris looks out at us with childish innocence and a touch of flirtatiousness. Clasping her voluminous dress like a grand lady, she is ready to dance. She will soon be a woman and will fall in love. There are many indications of her destiny. The shield is in the shape of a heart. Beside it lies Cupid's arrow. Red and white roses in the basket. The dog, guardian of propriety, has fallen asleep. The painting is rectangular, but it used to be round. One can see where parts were added. Perhaps it was changed to fit the decor of a certain room because paintings like this were considered part of a palace's decoration. Architecture, interior design, sculptures, paintings all had to harmonize, carefully composed to create a complete Rococo experience. Pictures were often integrated into wall panelling, as we see here in the music room at Sans Souci in Potsdam, the summer residence of Prussia's most famous king, Frederick the Great. Frederick loved all things French. As crown prince and young monarch, he collected contemporary French paintings. Fifteen bateaux can still be seen in the royal palaces in Berlin and Potsdam. Four more are in the Gemälde Gallery. Here we see Frederick about a year before he became king. It's one of the last paintings for which he actually sat as model. Later, he would refuse to do so. The portrait is by Frederick's French court painter, Antoine Penn. He had also worked for Frederick's father and grandfather. Here he has taken a little time out to introduce himself and his daughters. The master has a pen to hand, ready to record, say, the beauty of a flower. In the foreground, the antique roots of art, Ovid's Metamorphoses, a rich source of stories for pen, as it had been for Rubens, and sculpture, represented by a plaster copy of the head of the famous Apollo Belvedere. The year is 1754. Penn is 71 and a successful man. His expensive clothing suggests he is the equal of any aristocrat. The dogs are fashionable status symbols. It's obvious that he enjoys considerable respect at the Prussian court. Frederick II loved art and he also used art to glorify his realm. Prussian palaces had long had galleries for works of art, but Frederick was the first to commission a special building for his collection. To demonstrate Prussia's eminence, the king now started to collect more systematically. His agents combed Europe to find prestigious works. Perseus freeing Andromeda by Rubens, for example. His Saint Cecilia, or Correggio's Leda and the Swan. But Frederick's Sans Souci gallery was still part of his palace complex. At the end of the 18th century, the call for a truly public museum became ever louder, and after Napoleon had transformed Europe, the ideals of the bourgeois enlightenment also took root in Prussia. The old masters should be a source of delight and edification for all. A special commission picked out the best paintings from the royal palaces. 
the Giustiniani and Soli collections were purchased. Prussia's greatest architect, Karl Friedrich Schinkel, created the setting for these jewels. August the 3rd, 1830, saw the ceremonial opening of the Royal Museum. The world has changed much since then in war and in peace. Berlin, too, has undergone transformations. Royal museums may now be state museums, but their purpose has remained the same. One could still hang a sign in bronze above the door that reads to delight and to edify, for that is the aim of the Gemälde Galerie, to allow people to enjoy pictures and the many registers and genres of art, and also to enable them to learn something about earlier cultures, to see how different temperaments and emotions have been depicted, how fashions and the styles and idioms of artists continuously change over the course of time. Many visitors are perhaps fascinated to see how all the things with which we surround ourselves are subject to change. In exploring our gallery, perhaps we feel how even everything we consider to be contemporary is really specific to a certain time. Auch das ist, was wir heute als zeitgenössisch erfahren und kennenlernen.